Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Creating Sustainable Scale, How CapTrust's Unique Model Drives Enormous Growth and a Billion-Dollar-Plus Valuation. It's a conversation with Rush Benton, Senior Director of Strategic Growth for CapTrust and Lewis Diamond. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. The ability to serve clients without conflict and with complete objectivity is typically the reason many advisors choose to build their own independent firm. Because as an RIA, advisors can design and grow their practices as they see fit, liberated from the corporate agenda that is part of the fabric of working for a brokerage firm. And it's through this liberation that we've seen the growth of several massive RIA firms that are making headlines through smart acquisition practices alongside solid organic growth. One such firm, CapTrust, launched back in 1997 when Fielding Miller and David Perkins broke away from regional brokerage firm Interstate Johnson Lane, or IJL, to pursue an innovative fee-based advisory approach and fulfill their commitment to ensure complete objectivity in all client transactions. It was a journey they started with just $2.5 million in revenue and client assets under advisement of a mere $400 million. Two years later, assets grew to a billion dollars. And now, just over two decades later, the firm reports over $400 billion in assets under management. It's a success story that revolves around a firm's determination to build upon the commitment and vision of its founders, as Rush Benton, CapTrust Senior Director of Strategic Growth, describes it. He joined the firm back in 2013 after serving as co-founder and CEO of Wealth Trust, one of the first consolidators of RIAs. Today, Rush leads the company's wealth management acquisition efforts in search of what he describes as durable firms looking to be acquired. So when it comes to growth through acquisition, Rush knows his stuff. In this episode, he and Lewis Diamond have a spirited conversation about growth, how a firm like CapTrust achieves it, and even more specifically, what Rush describes as creating sustainable scale. They talk about the minority investment GTCR made in the firm in June, the $1.25 billion valuation, and what this means for the firm going forward. For independent business owners, this episode serves as a primer on both how to prepare your firm for sale, as well as how to become an acquirer. And for prospective breakaways, Rush shares some of the secret sauce that helped drive the early growth of the firm and how those same practices are still being used today. So let's hand the mic over to Lewis and listen in. Rush, thank you so much for joining us today and willing to be a really active and engaging participant in today's episode. Glad to be here, Lewis. Let's jump right in. There is a lot to talk about and a lot of ground to cover. So before you join CapTrust, um, can you give us a little bit about your background, how you got started in the industry and how you got to where you are today? Uh, Sure. I have been in the industry really my whole career. I graduated from Vanderbilt in 1981 and uh, got a job at a local trust company and started working with high net worth clients there uh, right out of school and have really been in one form or fashion in the industry ever since. I left that trust company uh, with two other gentlemen, and we started our own RIA back in 1984. 
And uh, that was uh, focused on institutional clients. So we were actually a money management firm and we grew that to, I think it was around 3 billion in assets uh, when I left in the late nineties, because I had this crazy idea that the independent RIA world was going to consolidate. And I felt like being a 36 year old, I was just the guy to do that. So I had this crazy idea to start a company called Wealth Trust, uh, which I did in the late nineties. And uh, I raised capital from a few sources and, and uh, to make a long story short, acquired maybe, let's see, I think I acquired 12 different firms across the country. It was one of the first ones to do that and um, had about $10 billion in assets under management and uh, was backed by private equity in 2007, uh, brought in a new PE partner, did a few deals, basically did them right at the top uh, before the Great Recession hit. That was lovely. And uh, by 2011, I felt like it was time to exit that business and uh, figure out what was going to be next. So sold that business uh, to private equity, uh, and it subsequently was bought a few years later by uh, Hightower. So it's now under the uh, care and feeding of Bob Oros. So that's how I got to the point at which uh, Cap Trust came into the picture. I had sold Wealth Trust and took a couple of years to do some consulting work and I did a little fly fishing and tried to figure out what I wanted to do with the last third of my career, let's call it. And I got a call from Cap Trust and made the mistake of going to Raleigh, North Carolina, where the company's headquartered and uh, was just absolutely astounded by what a great company it was and how, how strong the vision was and how successful it was and what a great platform it, it was. And so I agreed to join them to uh, head up strategic growth and in particular, focus on acquisitions of wealth management firms. So that's how I got here today. Very interesting. So you were a real pioneer in identifying the independent space as being a not just a place to spend your career and, and try to build a couple of businesses, but you also identified the trend that now seems so obvious that the wealth management industry, especially in the RA space, is highly fragmented, and that there is an opportunity for a scaled platform to try and uh, take advantage and try to help these firms. It's very interesting how you got to where you are. Can I ask you, um, did it ever enter your mind after you got out of Wealth Trust to start up another entity rather than going into an existing and somewhat mature business in Cap Trust? It did. Yeah, I actually had a few conversations with some private equity firms about just starting uh, over again. Uh, with a little bit different twist. And at the time, I felt like, and again, this, uh, I guess, has also been proven uh, true. I I felt like this industry also uh, lent itself to minority investments. And I really felt like there were two paths. You you either need to buy 100% of the business and fold it in and integrate it, which is what CapTrust does. Or you need to acquire a minority interest and just have a financial transaction and leave the company alone, provide some strategic advice, you know, solve some capital problems that the company may have uh, and let them run independently. And there are some firms out there doing that now, like Kudu is a good example of that. The issue I had with that was you, you really have to buy large firms for that to be successful. I don't think making a minority investment in a small subscale firm would accomplish anything. So I did, in fact, look at uh, potentially raising some money to form a, you know, an investment company that would take minority investments in these firms. Chose not to do that. I actually, actually was kind of in the process of thinking through that when I got contacted by CapTrust. So I think there's, you know, those are the two paths that I think are, are going to be successful uh, in the business. Absolutely. And it sounds like your early experiences really informed not just your career path, but also the M&A strategy that you deploy now at CapTrust. Um, so that's very interesting how you got to where you are. Let's segue a little bit to CapTrust in particular. CapTrust has a really interesting story dating back to the late 80s, I believe, when the founders initi- initiated their career um, at Interstate Johnson Lane, more of a regional brokerage. And then I believe 
joined the breakaway movement themselves um, long before it was so popular. Can you share a little bit just about the lineage and history of Cap Trust? Yeah, it is interesting as we think about it now, look, you know, in the rearview mirror, uh, Fielding Miller and David Perkins, who were the co-founders of uh, Cap Trust, were kind of original breakaways. And they left IJL, which I think at the time was owned by Wachovia. And, you know, the reason they did that is there, there just wasn't a, a platform at that firm that supported what they were doing, which was essentially fee-based advice for wealth clients, as well as, and this was what was unique, the retirement plan advisory consulting work that they were doing. Uh, they were really pioneers in that effort because back then, uh, most 401k plans were kind of set it and forget it and collect trails kind, kinds of arrangements, either through uh, mutual fund companies or insurance companies. And uh, Fielding and, and David felt like there was a better way to do that, that it was time to get on the, the same side of the table as the client and act as a fiduciary. And they were just early in that. Uh, and IJL, Interstate Johnson Lane, just really had no platform to support that. Um, so, yeah, it was in, I think, about 97 that they went independent. And uh, I think we, I think back then they left with maybe a dozen employees and had a few hundred million dollars in assets and, you know, two or three million dollars in, in revenue. So that was the genesis. Which is just some crazy growth. I think on your website, it actually says they launched the business with about two and a half million in revenue, client assets under advisement of 400 million and then within two years surpassed a billion in AUA end of 2005 reported AUA of 10 billion and then today the firm is advising on a whopping 400 billion plus in assets and that's a growing number it's just it's remarkable and incredible to go from being an really early early inning uh, breakaway um, to build such an extraordinary and thriving and growing business can I ask you a couple of questions just about the business today? So I believe there's about 700 employees. Is that accurate? It's probably 750. So it's, it's, it's no longer a small company, that's for sure. And how has the original vision that Fielding Miller and Dave Perkins initially had back when they broke away, how does it play into the firm's goal and the value proposition today? Well, it's a good question. One thing is just to, just to catch up on the Perkins story. So they also started a, uh, a hedge fund of funds called Hatteras. And at some point, I think it was in the early 2010, 11, something like that, they decided that Hatteras really needed to be its own company and CapTrust should be its own company because it was difficult to sell Hatteras to your CapTrust clients as a fiduciary. Uh, you know, didn't want to have any product to sell, essentially. And so David Perkins took Hatteras and Fielding Miller took Cap Trust and they split the company up. So that's one way in which the original vision uh, changed, I guess. There, there was a division or a company called Hatteras that was part of all this back in the early days. And now, now that's gone. But for Cap Trust, I don't, I don't think the vision has changed much. That's one of the most remarkable things. And one of the things I really admire about Fielding is his ability to just maintain focus. You see many opportunities, really at, at any size business, you see a lot of different opportunities come along and you have to evaluate those and decide, you know, is that taking us in the right direction or not? And I would say that the vision at CapTrust, that, that is to, to build a scaled organization that provides fiduciary advice on a national scale. We haven't wavered from that. We get asked these questions all the time. Well, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? or uh, we got asked last week, you know, are you thinking about international? You know, Fielding's response to that was we might have a 2% market share in the U.S. So I think there's plenty of good opportunity here. Why would we waver from that? So the core business uh, strategy has has only changed, I would say, in, in kind of one way. And that is the original focus from a geographic expansion standpoint was to acquire firms that were primarily retirement plan advisory shops or firms. And so we did that. And we, we felt like we, we could develop a national presence in that market by getting really into maybe 20 different states. That's, that's where the primary market for those services uh, was. 
And then in 2013, when I joined, we took that strategy and expanded it to say, you know, if we've got a retirement plan advisory firm in a location, it would be terrific if we also had a wealth management team in that location, because the synergy between those two sides of the business is, is really undeniable. And so we've obviously, since I, I joined, we've expanded uh, rapidly in the wealth management space. A, a lot of people get a little confused and think we've always just been a retirement plan shop and we only recently got into the wealth business. But the reality is we've been wealth advisors since inception. It's been core to what we do. Uh, we've just expanded it geographically uh, over the last seven or eight years. Got it. And can we talk a little bit about how how have you grown this much? Um, to I mean, it's 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 remarkable and honestly pretty hard to fathom how you could grow from two and a half million or so in revenue to now being valued at almost one point two five billion and growing. So you mentioned a couple of items with the synergies between the retirement plan consulting and the, the traditional wealth management. And I know you're in charge of acquisitions, but what else would you credit with the growth? Well, it's a great question. And I would tell you that we think about growth every day and we think about primarily organic growth every day. So one of the key partners in this business who's been around since almost the beginning is a guy named Wilson Hoyle. And Wilson would be a great interview for you at some point because he is he is responsible for the organic growth strategy of the company. And there's so many different facets to it, Lewis. One, and I'll start at the top and then maybe work down to a little bit more granular view of this. But one is just to literally have a growth culture. Uh, so many RIAs do not have that. You know, they have it in their early years, perhaps, because they have to, to put food on the table. But they get to a point where it's just a great lifestyle business. and Markets go up a little bit every year, so maybe revenue goes up and a client uh, or two will refer a friend in. And so you pick up a new client or two and, you know, life's pretty good. It's a great lifestyle business. And Wilson and Fielding are just sales oriented, growth oriented builders. And so the whole company has a an attitude of growth, if you will. Uh, particularly on the organic side, you know, you, you then break that down into, well, what do we have to do um, to make that successful? And it also goes back to the, the old brokerage firm days. And, and I think it's true to say that there is a lot of sales energy in the brokerage business. Always has been. A lot of very successful people there because they're not afraid to pick up the phone. They're not afraid to go sell something. The problem has been or was the, the incentives were misaligned. They were incentivized to go sell something. And what that something was, wasn't necessarily the best thing for the customer. It was the thing that paid the most to the broker, just to oversimplify perhaps. So Fielding and Wilson took that sales culture and, and uh, mentality and brought it over to the fiduciary side of the business where we're still selling. And we like to say we sell air. <laughs> You know, I mean, there really isn't anything tangible where there's not a widget that's being sold here. It's just advice. But we're doing it as a fiduciary in the best interest of our clients. And we're product agnostic, which is where many independent RIAs are, of course. But they don't have that sales mentality and that sales energy and that sales culture. And in fact, they kind of think it's a bad thing, to be honest with you, because they look at the brokerage world and they think, oh, you know, that's just a bunch of, you know, salesmen selling the worst thing possible for their client, you know, so they can buy, they can make the payment on the Porsche next month or something. Well, that's just not the case, right? So first of all, you, you just have to have the sales culture and we have it. And then you have to have some pieces that align with that. So you have to have compensation that's in alignment with growth. So we have advisors across the country and their compensation is a function of their revenue. It's not a function of the product they sell. We're not selling a product, again, but it is a function of their revenue. And so if you want to make more money, then get some more clients. And, uh, you know, if you lose some clients and you don't like the fact that you're making less money, then maybe you'll, you know, you'll pick up the phone a little bit more often. So compensation alignment is really important. And then the second thing I would say is that you want to, you know, you want to have a, a holistic offering you want to have everything an advisor needs to be successful at their disposal. 
So you need subject matter experts who can make them look good, who can do a, help them do a better job for their clients, uh, which is a better way of saying it. It's not just that the advisor needs to look good. It's that, that what they're delivering needs to be uh, the best that it can be. Um, and so we have that. That's what scale means. And, and, and that may be a question we'll talk about later. But another thing we like to do is we like to, you know, we like to soften the beach, so to speak. So, for example, on the retirement plan side, we've got every retirement plan in the country uh, above a certain size in our database and they're getting dripped on. And if uh, if they make the mistake of opening a uh, an attachment that we've sent them, some white paper or something or or they sign up for a webinar, uh, we have a telemarketing team that's going to notice that because we have the technology to tell us that, of course, and they're going to make a phone call and and, uh, try and set up an appointment for an advisor. And the remarkable thing about that telemarketing team is they've been with us for well over a decade. You know, these are internal people in our firm. They're actually partners in our firm. So they've they've developed relationships over the years with some of these plan sponsors. Uh, You know, so it's not just every time a cold call. It it is, uh, it's a remarkable uh, thing to have that kind of longevity in that process. So you got to have alignment of, of uh, compensation. Uh, you have to have the, the right product or the right level of service. And you, you have to be able to soften the beach so that, you know, people are receptive to what you do. And when you look at what all this means over time, uh, it means that we've built a tremendous amount of scale in that effort that has basically created a flywheel. And so that organic growth each year, even though we're a bigger company, and we've got more revenue we're able to sustain that level of growth. And we're, you know, we're targeting sort of 10 to 12% organic growth every year. And it gets a little harder to do, but even with COVID this year, we're going to hit that goal. Incredible. And very much appreciate you sharing that with us. A couple of quick things that I noted um, that I'd like to comment on is, first off, I think you bring up a really good point that most wirehouse advisors now they view themselves as fiduciaries, even if they're not legally allowed to have that fiduciary hat on. They still do what's in the best interest of clients. They're mostly or all advisory. And it's more just a function of where they work that maybe they are precluded from doing certain things. But I think what's really interesting is one of the main reasons why there's been so many ridiculously successful breakaways is because they've married what you said, the the sales culture of the brokerage world, where they're not afraid to pick up the phone and they're self-motivated and they're driven by an eat-what-you-kill model but married it with the best-in-class technology and platforms and conflict-free nature of the RIA space. So I think that's a really interesting point. One other thing I wanted to just jump off on and ask you about, because I think it's pretty remarkable, is I believe just about all of your 700-plus employees are partners in the company. So it's not unusual that you see advisors and executive teams as owners in the company. Some businesses are obviously closely held. But you don't always see uh, more of the administrative staff and more of more folks in the support function um, become equity owners. Can you comment on that? Just kind of the thinking behind it and what it does for the organization. Sure, it is a real differentiator for us, and um, it, it has been a major factor, I think, in our success. And it, it goes back really all the way to sort of what is at the heart of what you're doing and what motivates you day to day. Our our leadership team is motivated to do the right thing for clients. It's also uh, focused on our colleagues and also our communities. But we really put all three of those things or those constituencies, if you will, on the same level. Uh, In fact, that's our mission statement. We talk about our clients, our colleagues, our needs. And if you're serious about your colleagues being uh, treated fairly and taken care of, then you have to think about how they can become equity owners. And Fielding did this a long time ago. He made the bet if he used equity as part of compensation for everybody, not just a few at the top, that we would have a a tighter culture. Uh, We could build a bigger company. We would be faster and stronger. And that ultimately we, we would be more successful. And that success then would mean good things for our colleagues and for our communities. And clearly it means good things for clients, because if you've got 750 people who are essentially all shareholders or, you know, in the process of becoming shareholders, they're going to put a little extra effort in as opposed to just being an employee. 
So it, it goes back to what sort of motivates your thinking and what it is that you want to build. And I can give you a couple of examples. So we take great satisfaction in the fact that we've got long-term employees, you know, who've been basically clerical staff, right? I mean, they come in at eight and they go home at five and, you know, they don't work on the weekends and, you know, they're just good people taking care of their families and all that and have good roles with us. And yet they've got, they're in several examples, they've got well over a million dollars worth of stock in cap trust. And these are people that, you know, have never made $100,000 a year. I mean, that, that feels good, you know? And then another example would be in this latest, uh, in, the, in the recap we announced earlier this year where we took on a minority uh, partner. And we said, look, we're going to pass the hat. We have really done well. We're getting a tremendous valuation. We're getting a big boost in everybody's equity value. We're going to pass the hat. And uh, we want to contribute to our, we have our own foundation, the, the Cap Trust Community Foundation run by employees. That's more good things for our communities, right? Not to mention the stuff people are doing locally. So we just feel like equity is something that should be shared. It motivates people. It lets you build a tighter culture. It lets you attract better talent. And it, it simplifies the management of the company because everything, take acquisitions, for example, there may be something that we're doing after an acquisition where we're integrating some system or something like that. And the acquired advisor doesn't necessarily like that. But I'll just say, look, can you put on your shareholder hat for a minute? This is good for everybody. It may not be the best thing for you in particular on this particular issue, but as a company building scale that we all own, it's better for the company. So this is why we need to do it this way. And that that takes care of that issue. Sorry for the long answer, but it's a really important facet of the company. And frankly, it's something that that with firms that join us via acquisition, who have not been able to solve that issue on their own. In other words, they'll have, they might have 50 employees and they've got five shareholders. They love the fact that, that by rolling their business into cap trust, all of their employees are now going to have access to the same type of program that gets equity to. It's, it's really amazing because it is a big bet when a company is first starting off that you're going to share the closely held equity with the team. And obviously, knowing what you know now and seeing that the company is valued at $1.25 billion, giving up equity is expensive. But clearly, it's had a major, major impact on how you grow the company, why the company is special. And it's not something you see in every organization. You also have to love the community aspect and sharing in your own successes with those less fortunate, including your employees, too, to give um, employees, who you said, make less than $100,000 a year the opportunity to create real wealth simply by being loyal and working hard is not something you see in every firm, not even in every part of this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Rush, let's shift gears a little bit. A lot of your marketing materials, when I see you quoted in the press and the value proposition on your website, talk a lot about scale. Since every firm has a different definition of this and maybe approaches it differently, how would you describe the term as it relates to your business? That's a great question, Lewis. And you are right. Everyone has a little different definition of it. And, and I would say, uh, I'd make this observation, it, it's also changing rapidly. Because I think Cap Trust has one level of scale. You know, Merrill Lynch has another, and that's well beyond where we are. And yet our scale is well beyond where a typical independent RIA would be. So it's a bit of a moving target. I guess I would describe it uh, this way, and that is specialization is really important. So we, we have advisors, and all those advisors have to do is be advisors. We, we don't have a single advisor who also has to put on the compliance hat or the HR hat or the technology hat or anything like that. I think that's the first level of scale is where you can get to professional management. A lot of firms will talk about, oh, you know, we're, we're at a billion dollars now in, in AUM, so we're going to hire a chief operating officer. And that's great, but you still probably have founders of the business who are advisors and the main owners. And they're still wearing many hats, even though they've got a chief operating officer. So I think you have to think way beyond that to what, you know, what could be, you know, what, what is possible. And um, 
it's kind of fun to, to be at Cap Trust and look around. One of the favorite things I get to do is when a firm is thinking about joining us, they'll come for a visit to Raleigh, where we've got uh, four full floors of an office building and probably 350 people. And uh, this was all pre-COVID, by the way. I'm looking forward to getting back to these days. But um, <clears throat> one of the best things we can do is just walk around. Because we'll run into people and they'll describe their role. And inevitably, the folks that are visiting will say, gosh, I wish we had that. I wish we had somebody who did nothing but that. Because I I do it and, you know, it's a pain and I can't really do it well. And I have to devote a a little bit of time to it uh, on the weekends or something. You know, and that's whether it's technology or marketing or, you know, finance or, you know, investments, you know, full, full investment team, all that. So scale in, in some sense just means more people dedicated to specialty functions, because if that's all you do, you're going to be better at it. And then the other thing I would say is we have this funny little saying, we like to say if, if we hire somebody, you know, at a very senior level, we, it's like the uh, wheel of fortune game, you know, we bought a vowel. <laughs> so if you look at our chief technology officer, for example, relative to most firms, most firms have somebody who's probably, you know, geeky, you know, pretty good at software, can, you know, make the printer start working again when it, when it stopped. You know, we, we've got a chief technology officer that, that could be the CTO of a major bank. I mean, we're investing way beyond what most firms are doing from a technology standpoint, because it's that serious and we think it's it's not long before independent RIAs are going to learn that their systems, which contain a lot of really important uh, information about clients, are are not necessarily safe. Um, and so we're we we feel like we're way ahead of that. And I guess the the theme there is is just that the gap between having scale and not having scale is growing, and it's growing because. You know, every year, a large firm like Cap Trust that's able to reinvest a significant amount of its uh, profitability back into the business is creating a bigger and bigger gap between those who do not reinvest back in their business. You know, most independent RIAs literally kind of clean out the cash register right at the end of the year. You know, maybe they save a little, put a little money aside to buy you know a few new computers or they need to hire somebody, but they're really lifestyle businesses that are not really reinvesting for the future. And so I think if you're not doing that versus a big firm that is, you're just seeing a bigger and bigger gap between those two. Well said. What about the concept of of renting scale? So a lot of potential breakaway advisors and even existing RIAs might opt to hire a service provider or a platform that has 50, 60 people that they can leverage for a cost. What would be your thoughts on that as a way of gaining scale versus the cap trust way, which is home growing your own talent and building everything as one cohesive firm? Well, I I think that's probably an interim solution. But if you look at advisors today who are with wirehouses, in a sense, they're running their own business, but they're also renting scale by virtue of their payout, right? They don't control the scale. They don't control the reinvestment. They don't control the technology. It's it's there for them to use. And I would submit that a lot of advisors, you would know better than I, they're really not happy with that. They'd rather have more control. And so that's why there's a lot of breakaway activity where they're trying to gain more control, obviously. And yet, if they gain some control, but also have to go rent from a platform, you know, they're taking a little bit of a step back versus doing it themselves. So if you compare that to cap trust where we've got the best of both worlds, I think because we do control that because we've built it ourselves. Um, I think that's a better long-term solution. And I will say this, it absolutely creates more value, more enterprise value. Yes. It's expensive to have a 30 person investment team and 25 people in marketing and uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 people in technology, including application development people who, build stuff. But when the potential capital partners looked at us, what they saw was sustainable scale. And as I mentioned earlier, a widening gap in that. 
So I think that the, the opportunity to really benefit and actually help define what the platform looks like as an advisor at CapTrust, to me, just seems that seems better than just renting it. And also as a shareholder, you're benefiting from the scale that's created and the valuation that's created by doing it. I love that term, sustainable scale. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to leverage that myself, if you don't mind. Have at it. Trademark. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I appreciate it. So CapTrust pursues scale in two distinct, yet as you've mentioned, pretty interconnected ways. The first is the high net worth market where you're leading with a planning-based approach and working with two-legged individuals. But at the same time as well, you're also a leader in the 401k consulting world. Can you explain a little bit more about this methodology and just this overall business model? Because it is different than a lot of RIAs that tend to just focus on one or the other. Yep. There are some RIAs on a smaller scale than CapTrust who do have some of both sides of the business. And when we talk to them, they completely get it because they will have, for example, a handful of local companies where they are the advisor on the 401k. And they're also, you know, the wealth advisor to the CEO, right? And which came first, the CEO or the plan doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's it's one relationship. And so they totally get it. The thing about uh, scale at CapTrust is the number of retirement plans that we have across the country. And this is not, not only 401ks, it's 403bs, it's, you know, it's defined benefit plans to the extent that there are still some of those around. It's some endowments and foundations, that sort of thing. We have uh, just a, a massive client base there. And that, if you put it all together, leads to about 3 million participants. And we've built the service offering to go from the, as we say, the cash register to, to the C-suite. So if it's executive financial planning at a very high level that a family that owns a privately held business needs, we got that covered. You know, if it's a Fortune 500 public company, a C-suite that needs expertise you know, in their financial planning needs, we've got that. And if it's the cash register person who needs just some advice on how to allocate her 401k, we've got that too. And we've been able to leverage some technology to be able to provide all that, but it really does run the gamut. And it makes us incredibly competitive on the retirement plan side from a new business perspective because it took scale to build that offering and most of our small competitors just do not have it. So how do they deliver that? Well, the advisor has to go meet with employees. Well, our advisors don't have to do that. We have teams of people who do that. We have a call desk. We've got retirement plan counselors, you know, geographically spread across the country. You know, we've got technology that, that enables us to do this, some proprietary stuff that we built. So it makes us very competitive on those retirement plan clients. And they more and more and more appreciate the fact that what they're doing in terms of contributing to the retirement plans is actually benefiting their employees. And really, you can look no further than a higher education, for example. If you think about COVID and, and the impact that it's had on uh, colleges, they've had a tremendous revenue shortfall. So what would they like to do? They'd probably like to get some professors who are tenured, who are older, who make a lot of money and teach two classes a week to retire. How are they going to get them to do that? They've got to get them to understand that they're able to retire, that they're ready to retire. And um, so it adds a lot of value for us to be able to go in and, and have those conversations. And what that leads to is an opportunity for wealth advisors to get in front of those clients employees, executives, professors, whoever, and really provide good holistic advice. And, uh, you know, from a, from a fee-based fiduciary standpoint. So you put those two things together, it's really like having reserves in the ground, oil reserves in the ground. We just need to build the oil wells to tap into it. And that's why we're expanding geographically with wealth management acquisitions is so we can get high-end wealth advisors plugged in at the higher levels of those client needs, uh, which, which generates its proximity to wealth. And what wealth advisor, if they're growth oriented, wouldn't want to have more meetings with people who need their services. Absolutely. And 
moving over to the M&A part of our discussion, a lot of our series is based upon, I would say, more of the retail or ultra high net worth focused wealth management unit. It doesn't necessarily touch on the more of the institutional side, the retirement side of your business. Would you describe the trends for consolidation within the retirement market? Is it somewhat similar to the wealth management market where we have an aging owner population and firms are looking for scale and struggling with growth? Or are there different drivers than we're seeing in wealth? No, Lewis, I think it's all the same. I think they've got the same demographic uh, challenges with succession and um, the same motivation as, as the wealth advisory firms. I do think that they feel, though, a little more strongly the need for scale and the, the challenges of being a smaller firm. And so, for example, that participant advice service that I just described from the, you know, from the cash register to the C-suite, the ability to deliver that, they really can't deliver that. And so they, the retirement plan advisory firms that have joined us, you know, have, have been able to take that service offering immediately to their existing clients and generate additional revenue. And that, that's a good thing. And they've, you know, their growth rate has been hampered because if they're competing with us, and they can't offer that, then they're not going to win the business. And there's another element that has become interesting in that space, which is, you know, that's a very RFP driven process. If a plan sponsor is going to hire a new consultant, new advisor, they typically do it through an RFP process. We are seeing a, a, a marked increase in the focus on technology and cybersecurity to the point that we've had our chief technology officer on several finals presentations. Well, if you're a small shop and you and you're out, and by the way, you're outsourcing your cybersecurity, and your technology compliance, that's just not going to compete. It's not going to be good enough. So I, I think I think and we have a very robust pipeline right now of, of potential acquisitions in that space, the latest of which was Plant Moran's uh, division uh, that provided that service, you know, has, has has joined us. I think scale really matters there, frankly, more so than in the wealth management space. That is one of the resistant points that wirehouse advisors have about going independent is the fear of not just taking on some extra risk, but the cybersecurity investments and fear of keeping data safe. So it makes sense that a plan sponsor um, would have similar concerns as well. Can you briefly just touch on your M&A strategy? What is it that you look for in a potential firm? Obviously, you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prints. And given just your stature in the industry, you probably see most transactions probably come across your desk, but obviously you don't do every deal. So what is it that you specifically look for when you're evaluating a potential new partner of CapTrust? Well, it's cliche to say this, but the, really the first, the first thing is culture. Is it a good cultural match? If it's not, and that's a little bit intangible. You know, so for example, I had a meeting uh, a year or two ago, Rick Schaff and I went into this guy's office and, um, you know, he, it, his name was on the door and literally his portrait was hanging in the uh, lobby. That's like, you know, that's probably not a guy who's going to be a good team player. <laughs> so, you know, we'll, we'll sort of pass on this one and over lunch, it proved to be uh, the, the right choice. So it's intangible, but it's really important. I will say this. Most firms are going to be a good cultural fit because they are good people. You can't be successful in this business if you're not a good person. You're just not. So we're looking for, for firms that still have some gas in the tank. You know, they want to grow, but they've got some challenges and they, they are looking for a transaction to help with those challenges. There has to be a catalyst. If there's not a catalyst to do something, then what we have found is there's a lot of tire kicking. There's a lot of, gee, what's my business worth? Uh, yeah, why don't we go to dinner? You know, there's not enough time in the day to have those conversations. So somebody has to have a real catalyst. And the typical catalyst behind most of these transactions that you're seeing is there is an older founder or generation of founders, and they are looking for some liquidity. They're looking for a way to transition the business to their next generation. And frankly, they, ha they haven't been able to figure it out themselves with an internal transaction. 
So they're looking externally to do it. And that's where I think we have an advantage because the the ability for the next generation to continue to own equity, it's, it's going to be equity and cap trust, but it's equity and it's significant nonetheless, really does solve uh, a lot of what they're they're looking for. Perfect. And once a firm does a transaction with cap trust so that the ink is dry, what aspects of the business does that firm retain control over? And what aspects do they relinquish control um, of to cap trust? Good question. The short answer is what's client facing doesn't change much. So, for example, if you've you've got an advisory team that is working with a certain type of client and they want to meet with them four times a year and, and they want to do financial planning in a certain way, the clients are there because they like that service and they're accustomed to it. And that's what the advisors are equipped to deliver. And so we we would never want to change that. And the client probably knows when it's time to do open up a new account. They don't necessarily call the advisor. They call, you know, the advisor's key assistant who probably knows the grandkids names, you know, and how was the vacation last month kind of thing. So the relationship part definitely does not change. I mean, it it is definitely not a 1-800 cap trust, you know, what's your account number kind of thing. But what we do change is the corporate uh, platform. So the name changes, you know, it's transition. It's not, you won't rip the bandaid off, but we do change the name. We operate under one brand name. And, you know, we have one platform for corporate services, whether it's compliance or accounting or, you know, finance or marketing or all of the, you know, facilities and technology, all that stuff is, it is one company. And so the advi- the local advisory team really only has to focus on taking care of clients and looking for new clients and availing themselves of all of the resources at CapTrust from an investment standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, you know, to make themselves better at what they do and, and provide better outcomes for their clients. A lot of firms join us and, you know, they'll literally say, look, I'm just tired of running the business. It's not fun anymore. It was fun when I was young and I was entrepreneurial and I started it. That, you know, that was cool. Well, now I'm, you know, 58 or 60 years old. And I, I just want to take care of my clients. I don't, I don't really want to have to think about what the healthcare plan is going to be next year. So I hope that answers your question. But there's a lot that changes for the better and then a lot that does not change, particularly in the area of client relationship management. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And that's why there's so many different acquisition brands that are so successful in this industry because everyone has a bit of a different strategy and deal structure. And probably most importantly, the life after a deal looks a little bit different in each firm and really depends upon how much control an advisor or firm owner is willing to give up and how important is it for them to gain the things that CapTrust can provide, things like scale and next generation talent and capital. So I think it's it's really interesting the way you described it. And I'm sure there's plenty of firms that seem like a great mutual fit to begin with. But then as you dig into the process and you just begin to know each other more, it's pretty clear that there's things that they hold really near and dear to their heart that get them out of bed in the morning, that excite them, and that they probably don't want to hand off to cap trust. And then maybe they're not the best fit anymore. That's right. I, I would add one more thing to that, which is, Every firm that joins us has somebody that is really key to them from an operational and a day-to-day management of the business standpoint. And their first reaction when they hear my answer to the question that you just asked is, oh my gosh, you know, Bob's not going to have a job anymore, right? Well, hang on a second, because we are a rapidly growing company. And if Bob is really good at what he does, he's probably going to have a bigger platform on which to operate, whether it's a a kind of a regional role or whether it's a role for the company itself. We've had, I think, 45 people over the the last few years join us through acquisition in a corporate role. So two of our top investment team members came through an acquisition. Our chief legal officer came through an acquisition. We're doing a transaction right now where – the Bob of this company, uh, who will remain nameless, on paper looked like uh, there wasn't going to be a role for him. But when we got to know him, 
they were an absolute superstar. And so, you know, they're probably going to have a role on our integration team and, uh, you know, kind of help us integrate firms post acquisition and focus on firms on the West Coast kind of thing. So a lot of people worry about what, you know, what, you know, and, and rightly so, they're good people, they're loyal, they've, you know, they've had good employees, they don't want to just do a transaction that's great for them and then everybody gets fired. And that, that's not the case at all. It's a bigger opportunity really for everybody. So I, I just wanted to add that because some folks kind of react in a, in a negative way because they think people are going to lose, lose jobs. Yeah, it's important. Rush, how would you compare and contrast CapTrust to some of the other major acquisition brands in the market today, whether it's prior podcast guests like the Mariners, we have Mercer coming up, you have United Capital, and you have Creative Planning, you have Hightower. How do you compare and contrast to firms like that? Well, it's a great question. I'm a fan of all of those firms. Having started Wealth Trust when I did, and in some ways, I felt feel like I paved the way for those com- that now competitors. So they can thank me later, I guess. Everybody has a little different model. Independent firms, if they're smart about finding the right partner, they'll pay attention. You know, they'll have conversations with guys like me who call up and say, "Have you thought about doing something?" Just so they can learn and. Uh, I think there's different priorities for different sellers and there are different priorities for the different buyers. So some buyers may have a priority of, in my view, just getting as large as they can, as quickly as they can, so they can go public and therefore provide a a quick high return to their private equity investors. Others are more measured in their growth and I think are really trying to build something of more long-term uh, value, you know, creation than others. And I think there are different compromises that go into that. For example, if you're just trying to do something quick, you're going to have several different ways in which you'll do a transaction. Okay. I'll buy a minority interest or I'll buy a majority or I'll buy the whole thing. I'll change the name or I won't change the name. You know, you have, you can come onto my platform or not come on my platform. In other words, you're making it as easy for the seller as possible to get over any objections they may have. And I would contrast that with cap trust. We, we, we really do have one way of doing things. Not that there's not flexibility, but in general, you know, we're, we're going to change the name of the business. We're going to buy a hundred percent of it. People are going to become cap trust employees and you're going to become a cap trust shareholder. And we're all going to wear the same Jersey every day. So that's different. Now, what does that get you? It gets you, I think a much higher valuation long-term and, you know, a tighter culture. So other firms out there, I think, are focused on different niches. So I can, without naming names, I can think of one firm that that tends to want to buy smaller firms and let the owner exit and essentially take over the book of business. That's fine. I think you can create value doing that and good outcomes for clients. And there's certainly a need for that. You know, we tend to look for larger firms and uh, firms that have founders who, yes, are looking for some liquidity, but they're also looking for the next hill to climb and, and want to help us do that. And uh, they're, they're a little bit longer term partner for us. Then there's the whole issue of minority investments uh, versus majority versus you know 100% purchase. So a lot of different models out there. I, I would encourage firms that are thinking about doing something to take a deep dive on what day two looks like and really really look for the partner that that creates the right opportunity for them to grow and build their own net worth and and build their own revenue base versus just kind of punching out. So. Well said. Yeah. And and talking about valuation back in June of this year, there was very exciting news about your company when you sold a minority portion of cap trust to private equity shop GTCR. Why, after all these years, did you decide to take on a capital partner? Well, that's a great question. And yes, for many years, we just bootstrapped the company, uh, really since inception, which meant we were reinvesting our our own capital each year uh, back into people, buying vowels, as I mentioned earlier, or new systems or acquisitions. Where we got to last year, in the fall of last year, so about a year ago, we started to see an acceleration of the opportunity. With larger firms, you know, I'm talking about firms that are three, four, five billion dollars in assets under management, coming to us, having conversations and saying, you know, we're doing 20 or 30 million dollars a year in revenue, but 
but we really recognize that that's nowhere near where we need to be to have the kind of scale that you have. And so we're, we did one large transaction last year. We're going to do another couple this year, I believe. And so it became apparent to us that if we were going to sort of maintain what we felt like was a leadership position in the consolidation of the industry, it was going to take more than just our internal capital to be able to keep up with the opportunity. Now, we could have gone out and leveraged the business significantly. We had lots of banks, wanted to loan us a lot of money, but we're pretty debt averse and we wanted a a very conservative balance sheet. So it became apparent that it was time to bring in an equity partner. And we had, a, we had some criteria that, you know, determined what we were going to do. First of all, it had to be a minority investment. We were not going to sell a controlling interest in the firm. We're still going to run the business. And we wanted a partner that was in for at least a seven-year period. We did not want, you know, to be in the press every other year with, you know, another private equity transaction getting flipped, so to speak. And so we found in GTCR a firm that culturally felt great, really good people, strategically very helpful. They know the business. They were willing to say, look, we're in for a minimum of seven years and we'll take a, a minority interest and, um, and kind of help you guys grow this, grow this business, take advantage of the opportunity before us. So that's why we did it. And it's, uh, you know, it was a difficult process. We had lots of great conversations, but we were overwhelmed by the, the positive response from these firms who, by the way, have seen all of those competitors that you just mentioned, I'm sure, because they've all raised money at one point or another. We were just overwhelmed with their positive response to the platform that we had built, the integrated one company, all pulling in the same direction business that uh, was the original vision of fielding that we've now built. And the valuation you know, was uh, indicative of, of their confidence in that, in that business model. So that's why we did it. And uh, we're, we couldn't be happier. It's been, I've had some people ask me, you know, hey, is Fielding kind of hitting the beach? You know, he's, you know, he was the, he was the largest shareholder and that was a big trade. And the only image that comes to my mind is Omaha Beach. I mean, Fielding is hitting the beach like, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like we're a competitive firm. We're all sort of, ex- I shouldn't say all. I was a, I was a good high school athlete <laughs> where, you know, we have a lot of um, ex-athletes, college athletes and professional athletes in, in the business. And the feeling at Cap Trust right now is like it's the beginning of the third quarter in a really good game and the stands are full and maybe it's a Super Bowl. Who knows? But it's, you know, it's a it is a fun place to be right now. It is an aggressive, fun, energetic place to be. Perfect. Yeah. Maybe the stands aren't quite as full as they would be uh, in a normal season, but I understand your metaphor. One more quick question on the the capital partner. So I would assume for many, many years before this, um, probably since you joined CapTrust, a big part of your personal M&A playbook was selling against private equity and firms that took on private equity as having inpatient or non-permanent capital. Mm -hmm. Since you've now taken on GTCR, and I get that they're a longer-term investor and that they're aligned with your goals. Have you met any resistance and have you had any deals that aren't going to be completed because of the private equity firm not being invested? That's a good observation. I would tell you that the honest truth of that is that we have not. We've had zero pushback on that decision and the strategy that uh, that now exists. I guess it's because the strategy hasn't changed. It's just more capital. And if you think about a seller's perspective, selling to someone that is majority owned by private equity means they're controlled by private equity. And I, I had that at, Cap, at Wealth Trust. As the founder, I kind of had a founder's stake, but the majority of that company was owned by private equity. And there was no question who was in charge at the end of the day. And I would say that's something that's recognized by most independent firms. Uh, when they're talking to someone that is controlled by private equity, you're really selling to the PE firm. Well, Fielding Miller is still the largest shareholder in Cap Trust. And if you don't like Fielding, then, you know, you've got, it's, you know, it's, it's you, not us. And so we're still running the business. And I think the game still feels very much the same. Uh, there's just a little bit more capital to play with. So we've had no pushback. Thank you. Well said. And just to wrap it up real quick, a lot of changes going on, not just in the world, but in the industry. What are one or two trends or 
just things that you're excited to see in the industry and how do you think cap trust will adapt to those that's a good question we tend to again just kind of have a fairly vanilla view of the industry we don't think that hot topic you know trends necessarily get realized or accelerated you know if you you don't have to look far in the rearview mirror to see the robos you know that are now just kind of scattered about the side of the road i think the next generation of robos might be better but we just sort of plowed right through that and didn't get distracted by trying to do something in that regard i think the demand for advice and unconflicted advice is absolutely the you know the center focal point of our business and when you have an ability to provide that in a personal way augmented by technology of course you've got a winning combination i guess and we also think the shift from the warehouses to independence is slowed somewhat by covid and we'll come back even faster once this is behind us. And then we feel like the independent business model, you know, that we all represent has actually won the war. There's still going to be some skirmishes, but we've won the war. It's clear what the trend is. And when firms go independent, they often are so enamored. You would know this better than I, but they're, they're really enamored with being independent. And I get that. I mean, I'm entrepreneurial. Capture is the biggest company I've ever worked for. And that was only seven years ago that I wasn't kind of having done my own thing for the first 30 years of my career or something. So I, I get that. But I do think that scale is going to continue to matter. And there are going to be large national, one brand, independent firms. And uh, I think CapTrust is going to be clearly going to be one of those. And we'll see where it all goes. But we don't see anything disruptive. I'm knocking on wood here. I hope Amazon doesn't decide to totally disrupt this industry. I guess they could they <laughs> do it. Now. But uh uh, we, we feel good about how we're positioned and the, the scale advantage that we've got and the ability to grow. And, and that growth is just going to create a bigger scale advantage And because uh, we're going to keep reinvesting in the business. So I hope that answers your question. That definitely does. That was a great way to end. Uh, really appreciate your time today, Rush. This was informative on so many levels and really appreciative for you sharing the secret sauce of CapTrust and how you guys grew from two and a half million of revenue to now being valued at over 1.25 billion. Glad to do it. It's, it's a great story. I only wish I had gotten there sooner. <laughs> there we go. Appreciate the opportunity to share the story. Fielding and David started their journey with a goal of sitting on the same side of the table as the client and acting as a real fiduciary. And the result of building upon this vision has led to the creation of one of the industry's largest and most successful independent firms, one that shows no sign of slowing down. It's firms like CapTrust that have demonstrated the true potential of the independent space, and we're looking forward to see what lies ahead for them. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. Lewis or I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com or ldiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to AdvisorHub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.